Thank you, Noreen. Can everyone hear me? Um, while it is a great It is a great honor to be here tonight to celebrate the work of Frederick Bush with this distinguished panel. Along with John Cheever and Raymond Carver, Frederick Bush was one of the most important story writers of the second half of the 20th century. Anne Beatty called him one of our very best short story writers, and Newsday called him an American master. After his death, obituaries and publications like the New York Times and the LA Times compared his work to Cheever, Carver, and Chekhov. I began working with Fred as his editor when I acquired his nonfiction work, Letters to a Fiction Writer, in 1999, and then a story collection, Don't Tell Anyone, in 2000, followed by his novel, A Memory of War, the novel North, and his story collection, Rescue Missions. But long before I was Fred's editor, I was a reader and an admirer of his profound work. I was drawn to the way he wrote about relationships and family bonds in his novels and stories, and the unexpected ways in which human frailties undermine that love that mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, have for each other and the world around them. I was drawn to his portrayal of the American consciousness and as the Times wrote, of people and families grappling with existential crises. And boy, could he write a story. Heads, the first story in Don't Tell Anyone opens with a zinger. And here it is. Did I tell you she was raped? and not by the man she stabbed. If you, <laughs> if you could do something, I couldn't remember what, then you'd be able to do something else. I couldn't remember that either. I knew it was the poem they quote at commencements and at civic award ceremonies in small upstate communities like mine. I remembered the rhythm of its lines, but I couldn't remember the words. My head was a hive of half-remembered words, tatters of statement, halves of stories, the litter of alibis, confessions, supplications, and demands, the after effects, perhaps, of the time I spent standing beside my grown or half-grown, ungrown, ingrown child in a courtroom. She trembled, and I tried to situate myself, standing as we were before the clerk's desk, which was before and below the bench of the judge so that she could lean her thin, shivering body on mine, at least a shoulder or forearm, at least the comfort I could offer with the heft of my hand against the hard, cold, bony fingers of hers. This opening immediately establishes its situation, a parent coping with her daughter's pain and misfortune its point of view and its tenderness and poignancy. It both draws you in with the emotional pull of the situation, a daughter on trial, and awes you for the sense of authorial control. The narrator's grief for her daughter is so preciously rendered acute and devastating, and yet plainly specifically stated. Like so much of Frederick Bush's writing, it's incredibly humane. Not only was Fred Bush an amazing writer, he was also an amazing teacher, friend, and supporter of other writers. Years before I began working with him as his editor, he invited me to Colgate, where he taught to participate in a publishing panel. At the time, along with being a young editor at Norton, I was also a published poet and a writer struggling with a first novel that would eventually become my novel, House Under Snow. Fred, as he did so often to other writers, offered to read it in draft. I'd been struggling with the novel for years, putting it away in a drawer, pulling it out again. I was, in essence, teaching myself how to write a novel through my characters. The novel was about a young widow whose husband dies, leaving her with three young children in the early 1960s, written from the point of view of one of the daughters. 
Fred did not mince words. He was drawn to the characters, the poet, poetic language, and the setting. Then he said, but dear, you violated the two most important rules of writing fiction, point of view and plot. <laughs> <laughs> plot is, and this is his brilliance, plot is not action over time. Something dramatic must happen to change the nature of all that has come before. I had violated point of view because I was writing from the voice of a young girl, but giving the reader knowledge about the other characters that a young girl would never know. Those two comments were like a light bulb going off in my head. They transformed the way I thought about the novel and have since influenced my thinking about the art of fiction. Over the years I worked with Fred, there were so many things I learned from him. One pearl that I've shared with other writers was his comment about reviews. He didn't read his. He said, if I believe the good ones, that means I have to believe the negative ones. Touche, I thought. That he cared about the writing, the craft of writing, and he cared to help along other writers and friends as much as he did about his own work is evidenced by the volume we did together called Letters to a Fiction Writer that included contributions by Lee K. Abbott, Charles Baxter, Raymond Carver, John Gardner, Tobias Wolf, Flannery O'Connor, among others. When Fred passed away in 2006, he left behind a transcendent body of work, including 16 novels and six volumes of short stories. The stories of Frederick Bush includes 30 stories meticulously selected by Elizabeth Strout over the 90 or so he published, along with her insightful introduction. It celebrates the work of a true American master. I've asked the panelists here tonight to choose a passage from one of Fred's stories and then to uh, discuss its particular aspects that they're interested in. And Elizabeth Strout is going to wrap up by talking about the selection process. And now I'd like to introduce the panelists. Um, Liz Strout is the author of four novels, including the Pulitzer Prize winning Olive Kittredge, <coughs> and most recently, The Burgess Boys. Stuart Onan is the author of 14 novels, including Snow Angels, A Prayer for the Dying, Last Night at the Lobster, and Emily Alone. Most recently, he collaborated with Stephen King on the E story, A Face in the Crowd. Hilma Wolitzer has taught in the writing program at the University of Iowa, Columbia, Columbia University, and NYU. Her most recent novel is An Available Man. And Benjamin Bush is a filmmaker, writer, and photographer. He is the author of a memoir, Dust to Dust, and has published essays in Harper's and the New York Times Magazine. He's also a poet and received the 2013 James Dickey Prize for Poetry by Five Points and is a regular contributor to NPR and the Daily Beast. So we'll begin. say that you have to grab them right at the beginning, and I think he does in this story. Um, I'll read it first and then talk about it. It's called Metal Fatigue. And I didn't know where to break because his stories are so seamless you don't, almost don't want to stop, but I tried to find a natural place. What you might notice first is how dirty they are. It probably isn't from not bathing, though you have to wonder how they could have the energy to shower or wash their hair. I think that's what it was with my daughter and the others. They all had the look, 
all over their skin that you see on somebody's hair who doesn't shampoo. There was a dullness to them. They couldn't catch the light. But coming there to see someone, you still can hope. There are doctors and nurses. There are dirty pink walls and almost weak colored linoleum floors and ash furniture with yellow plastic cushions. There are closed circuit television cameras in the corners of rooms where pink wall meets bright white ceiling. There is someone in a security office dressed in jeans and a gold gym t-shirt who oversees the little screens of the monitors and supervises as many of the patients as he can. There are bedrooms without interior door locks that can be sealed from the outside and there are several sets of steel doors on each floor that open only with a staff member's card. There is a gray carpeted room with dark gray chairs and sofas on the street level inside the locked glass doors where family members sit until the ward doctor or nurse or psychiatric social worker sends word that they should ride the elevator up. So you can wait there or go up or sit in the ward cafeteria or the television room with its chain cigarette lighter and ceramic red ashtray and the laugh track of the rerun that seems always to be on and if you want to, you can hope. Linda and I sat at one of the cafeteria tables and watched a small young woman with matte finished dark blonde hair writing with a fountain pen in a leather bound journal. She bent close to the pages and wrote very slowly, pausing to look up, sometimes at us and sometimes at the other patients with their visitors, then leaning, on the, then leaning to the journal again. She's playing tic-tac-toe, Linda said over and over, X and then O, X and then O. No, I said. Oh yes, what, you think we're in here because we very sanely write in our journal all day? Dear journal, today I took my meds on time. I didn't spit out the mood enhancer or the antipsychotic. Not once did I try to gnaw through the vein in my wrist with my unbrushed teeth. Dad, we're nuts, remember? You're tired, you aren't nuts. God, Linda, if you're nuts, we're all nuts. And is that a consolation? No, I mean, it was nice of you to tell me. What I'm saying is I can't remember whether I feel good because of it or not. I got hold of both her hands, which were clasped in front of her, and covered them with mine. The backs of her hands were cold and a little damp. The skin of her face was very dry, and it looked as if she'd been standing in strong wind for days. <coughs> she was wearing fleece lined moccasins from which the staff had unlaced the rawhide, rawhide cords so she couldn't use them to hang herself. They flopped when she walked, but at least she couldn't commit suicide with her shoes. What's so funny, Dad? What's the joke? She pulled her hands away. <coughs> I shook my head. I think I'm getting a little strange myself, I said. This is almost the whole story. <laughs> it does go on and, and gets even better. Um, what struck me about this story is that everything is here. The relationship between the characters. You, you can surmise some history. You can surmise a future, the hope of the father, the uh, more or less sardonic desolation of the order. And I think the details that chained cigarette lighter, the red ceramic ashtray, the description of the unwashed hair not catching the light, the light being life itself, freedom. Uh, it's all there, it's all in these little clues. I mean, I think this is a story that writing students should read to learn how to write. <laughs> and I'm gonna say something about Greg, but I'd like to hear from other people first. I can go. <coughs> Um, I'm going to read the beginning of a story, um, which is sort of a memory story. I love memory stories about families, and difficult families. Um, this is Rise and Fall. His father rose early and climbed the attic stairs to bathe in the farthest tub of their house. He came home from work for dinner at 7 o'clock. In between for Jay Reese, it was school and his mother in the late afternoon. At every hour, though, he was the kind of boy who liked living alone, but especially after the war, during which he had lived by himself with his mother, while he was being six and seven and eight, 
His father was the figure disappearing in the early part of the morning and then coming home from the practice of the law while the day went dark. He remembered his father in two weekend costumes from those days in the Midwood section of Flatbush in Brooklyn in New York when the old <coughs> trees made the air green in summer and were a network of traps during the autumn and early winter for the paint spalding rubber ball the boys would bat with a sawed off broomstick as far down the narrow street as they could. In hot weather, his father would, on Saturdays, wear one of two seersucker suits. There was a brown and white stripe there was a gray and white stripe, and each jacket buttoned tight at the waist, and the trousers of each would cling to his father's thin legs. Just a beautiful memory there. Um, and there's, you can feel the cadences of Hemingway, the little run-ons, the and, the and, the and. Um, how quickly he takes us into that world, which we kind of know in a way, you know, Flatbush, late 40s, early 50s, we've seen that world before, but this is a very intimate way of taking us <coughs> the father's thin legs in the suit. It's really, really lovely. The intimacy of his voice, how well he knows his characters, and how difficult his characters are. Um, Jill mentioned earlier the pain and misfortune of families, and I think that was that's Fred's metier, really. Um, and he wrote in A Dangerous Profession, one of his nonfiction books about writing. He's writing about Hansel and Gretel here. He says, fiction that matters, of course, cannot be about living happily ever after. Serious writers don't, I think, believe in it, although they might want to keep trying. Serious writing is about the trail of life-saving breadcrumbs that are eaten by the forest birds. It is about being disposable. It is about what you say to yourself, even if you have defeated the terrible darkness of nighttime in the forest, or the witch at her oven, or the dangerous, unmapped distance that separates you from home. It is about living with the truth you've discerned but don't want to know. It is about hunger, how hunger comes first. Later in the same book, The Dangerous Profession, it's a lovely book, collect some of his reviews and essays. Uh, he's writing of a story by John O'Hara, uh, who is one of his favorites. Some of the importance of this story for me is its long look into what cannot be said, and its confrontation of the silence in which and from which so many of us suffer. I applaud O'Hara's attention to the differences of class, the cost of money, the size of the distances that separate us. I admire O'Hara's accurate use of facts to create a plausible world. I am profoundly moved by the sad, strong, patient suffering of O'Hara's characters and by the precision in its grappling with the silence of his character's speech. I envy the abilities of this author. I respect his hard work. I am moved at times by his fear of insufficient recognition. I have tried to learn from his life and from his work about my own attempts to write stories about which readers will care. And I feel the same way about Fred Bush. Um, even later, in the same book, he writes, A writer cannot be satisfied. There is no satisfaction, because writing does not offer that emotion. The talent that drives a writer, the ambition to publish, the energy to continue, these are why he or she must write. The gift, if it is that, is also the goad. It is an appetite that feeds itself. One writes because of the writing, attempting to create, as John Gardner so perfectly said, a vivid and continuous dream. And lastly, sort of in that same vein of, of continuing on, uh, this he's writing to an editor about a rejection letter the editor sent him. A very, <laughs> very, a very cruel, very cruel, Letter. So he's writing personally to him. He says, Soon enough, I was mule headedly writing more fiction, more letters to publishers and agents, complaints to my friends who had, only the day before, sent me letters about their out of typewriter experiences with publishers and agents. If one has talent, and it is the vastest assumption, isn't it? Then the next necessity is energy the energy to find and sustain story, that vivid and continuous dream about which John Gardner taught. 
It is an energy, sir, that permits one to receive letters such as yours and to sustain the damage they do, and then to return to all that darkness and the little pool of light within it where one works. As Hemingway's heroic gambler tells us in The Gambler, The Nun, and The Radio, one can only continue slowly and wait for luck to change. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so, he was a fighter as well, and I like that about him. I left out the second part of what I was going to say after the reading. Um, the main thing about Fred Bush to me is how he got everybody. I think what made him such a great writer was that ability to inhabit the head and the heart of a man or woman, a daughter or a father, a plumber or a farmer or a nurse or a deputy sheriff. This to me was amazing. Not just to know, get inside their skin, but to know what they did. All the plumbing details, I can't imagine. <laughs> so men could probably fill me in on that. Uh, and he was generous the way he was to his friends, to his characters, but he couldn't spare them completely. They suffered anguish as well as experienced joy in his stories, but he gave them what the novelist Harry Cruz deemed essential, which was mercy. And I really think that that's apparent in all of his stories. He was compelled to write. In an interview, he said, it's who I am, the man who makes up stories. And as Liz mentions in her beautiful introduction to this collection, he traced that compulsion to childhood, to the terrifying fourth grade teacher in Brooklyn he wanted to please, which he did finally with a poem. He made Miss White smile, and for the rest of his writing life, he made all of his readers smile and weep and think harder about how we live. He was prolific, almost 30 books. Read them, find them, read them. If he knew, as, all these books so written so quickly, it seems, as if he knew that he had to work hard and fast because he didn't have all the time in the world. It's still difficult for me to think about him in the past tense, him and Judy, because he was so alive in the page and they were so alive in the room. And I was kind of thrilled when I read Ben's wonderful memoir, Dust to Dust, that he spoke about them in the kitchen. I knew Fred and Judy in many places. I can't remember where we met. I knew them in Vermont. I knew them up at Colgate. I knew them in Manhattan, out in Iowa. But I think of them best upstate New York in their kitchen. And you must have been there, Ben, but I'm sorry. I don't remember. <laughs> I, I also found that I had a folder full of letters from Fred. I think he was a very prolific letter writer. I don't know how he did that with all the books as well. But some of the wonderful things, almost all of them are about the person who is receiving the letter. Praise and encouragement for your work. Or an invitation to come up and read or speak or teach. But every once in a while he talked a little bit about the writing process and what he was going through. Have finished the new novel, which really demands to be called On the Air, which I discovered was a very obscure piece by Philip Roth. I didn't know that. Which FS and G can square it with, maybe FS and G can square it with Roth for me. <laughs> have begun my newer novel called The Outlaw Jew. Its first sections are called Jew Shoes and Eichmann and I and Brains or Boobs, your average serious theological novel. <laughs> and today is the first day of school. I don't want to go. When can I be a full-time writer like the other grown-ups? <laughs> and then this one. Um, Judy, now, now that she's a librarian, is boss librarian lady of a high school about 15 miles from here. I've never seen her happier. And Ben and Nick are thriving on being hicks again. Me, I've just turned down a $40,000 a year job in the South, a $30,000 a year job in the West, and I've taken a pay cut to get more time to write. Don't ask, all right? I'm halfway through the first draft of a new novel, which is slowly killing me, and which I'm not smart enough to write. So it's business as usual, Shay Schmo. <laughs> <laughs> it looks as though they'll have a writer's conference at Colgate. They use my name, would that help or hurt? 
in ads, but I know nothing about it, and I'm delighted. <laughs> and working on a novel about Melville in New York, which Harmony Crown will presumably do, simultaneously public publishing a collection of stories. I'm only about 32 years away from having the Melville done. <laughs> Meanwhile, in a corporate suicide move, St. Martin's will publish my book of essays, The Dangerous Profession and the Fall. It's all about how hard we work and nobody loves us. <laughs> <laughs> and then I love this very much because it's so personal. It's about my husband. We made Morty's favorite meatloaf. Quite wonderful. I used the leftovers for sandwiches. Gotta spread that ketchup thin on the sourdough bread. Then you sit in your office with ketchup on your whiskers, and students come in to ask you to recite long poems with your mouth full. <laughs> <laughs> and then I will share the one that is so personal, if I can find it. I bought the real thing. The others are just copies. I'm so afraid of losing. This is the real thing. A typical freight postcard sent to me at Yaddo in can't read the, the thing, it just says 521. Dear Hilma, I love you. Right? Oh. <laughs>